Okay. Hello to everyone. I'm obviously not Jennifer. She is still traveling in Malaysia. And so um, I'm just going to go ahead and get this started with Scott Hathaway. He's going to go ahead and do the training for us this morning. And so enjoy. All right. Thank you. And we're going to just jump in. I want to um, just thank Jan for the opportunity to share this with you guys. And uh, are you guys able to see me? Yes, no? Can you, can you tell me real quick? I can't hear you. <laughs> yeah, we can see you and the PowerPoint. So okay, it's... perfect. All right, sounds good. Okay, so today um, I wanna just talk about like a guide to creation. And the reason I want to talk about that is because I think it's so important that we, we have more power than we actually um, identify with. And I want to go a little bit deeper than like you may be seeing The Secret or you've seen, you've read books about how positive thought will bring about positive change and things like that. But I want to get into a little bit more detail about how to make that happen, not just positively thinking, but going a little bit deeper into why that works how that works and what you can do to um, allow the process to happen quicker for you. So um, I have a, I have a little analogy here. Um, it's, it's the master builder versus the novice. And I want to give you guys the, the, an idea based off of um, just this analogy. So if you had a master builder and let's say me building a home and we had the same tools, the same amount of time, um, or we even had all the time that we needed to complete these two identical houses. And let's say that they were right next to each other. I want you guys to think in your mind when I ask these questions, just, to, you know, just answer these questions in your mind. But if, if you had me who's never built a house before, um, build this house and you had a master builder who'd been building for 20 years, but we had all the same things available to us, the tools, the knowledge, the, the, um, the architect, all of those things, the blueprints are the same. Everything is the same. The only difference is the person who's building it. Who at the end of completion of that house, who would you buy the house from? Would you buy it from the master builder or would you buy it from me? I just want you guys to think about that for a second. Okay. I'm going to pull this up and we are going to show this. Not technically the ad part, but didn't know that was going to happen. Okay, so I wanted you guys, I, I'm not sure if you heard what he said, but he said, you're born into a prison, a prison not of walls or mortar or anything like that, but a prison for your mind. And really, the thing that we do in our own lives is we create our own prisons within our own minds. We create our own prisons, and then 
we're not even sure sometimes uh, what we're creating or what other people are creating for us. And so my, um, my whole idea here is to help you understand how powerful you are and that you can guide the direction of your life. You can really have that much control over it. You can, you don't have to wait for someone else to take, um, and, and start to create your life for you. Because if you don't live with intention, then someone else will create that life for you. Okay. So what tools do we all have and how does it, how does it work? What's what, where does the ability to create come from? Um, so I'm, I'm big, um, into gospel principles. I'm a Christian and I think there's a lot of truths that we can learn from the Bible about, um, how our lives develop and work. And they come from, they come from Christ in that way. And he has the ability to teach us how those things work. And so I have a couple of things that I wanted to share with you in what I've learned and that what I've seen work in my, in my life based upon these principles, whether you're Christian or not, the principles are true. Um, it's just like science, um, you know, they go through and they test and they make, you know, different experiments work and then they know what's true, what's not true, what's going to happen every time. And it doesn't matter someone's opinion. It's fact, it's going to happen. Um, this is, this is how these things work. So, um, in the scriptures, it talks about how God created the word, the world. And the way he said it is that God created the world through faith and he spoke the word and the world was. And so being able to speak the word or speak what you want to create in your mind is very, very important. Okay. So when we go through and we have a goal and we write that goal down, that's important. But even more important is to actually speak that out to the world. So do you want to create doTERRA? What do you want to create? from your doTERRA business, how do you want to create it? What do you see as a result of that creation? Um, what's, you know, as doTERRA being your vehicle to achieving some of your other dreams, what is that going to look like for you? And then speaking that to people, letting them know what you are going to do, how you are going to do it, what you're going to create in your life is very powerful. So, um, so he spoke the world, the, the, word and the world was framed and then the other part of that too is is in going back to my analogy with the house is that architect uh sits down with the the person who wants to build the house and they the person who wants to build the house they have a desire and will they have to speak their plans they have to understand what they want and as they go through what they want then the architect can put it on paper for them and then they can start to construct and build that. And that's exactly how our life works as well. We have to have a desire and a will to do something. And um, sometimes in doTERRA, and I felt this way before, is I have a desire and will to build doTERRA. But at the same time, I, I felt like I didn't have an architect and I didn't have a master builder on my side who was helping me build this house that I was learning it by myself. But the reality is, got, the reality is folks, is that um, that master builder did not become a master builder overnight. It had it taken him thousands of houses to do before me and him competed on that one house. Okay. So he had built so many houses and he hadn't got every, you know, he hadn't gotten every square to a perfect 90 degrees. He'd never gotten um, the mud and tape correct. He didn't get every piece of plumbing he ever put in correct. It's in the doing that we become the masters of what we want to do. And so that desire and will has to stay with us long enough for us to develop the skills and the skills necessary to um, do what we need to do. But we all have the same tools, okay? Um, we all have the same tools. Our, we all have the faith tool. We all have the ability to build. We all have the ability to get up off our couch and go out and talk to people. We all have the ability to call up our uplines and ask them for new ideas when we feel stuck. We all have the ability to mentor and guide people with what we have learned. You may not know exactly how to do everything in building your house, but I'll tell you what, if you've put in plumbing 300 times or you've followed up 300 times or you've closed somebody 300 times or you've shared a sample 300 times, that skill, that 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 ability 
you've become more of a master at. And so you have the ability to teach someone else that skill. I really like this uh, quote and I'm going to read it. It says, yes, we, uh, or it says, God left us the world unfinished for man to work his skill upon. He left the electricity in the cloud, the oil in the earth. He left the rivers unbridged and the forests unfailed and the cities unbuilt. God gives to man the challenge of raw materials, not to eat, not the ease of unfinished, not the ease of unfinished things. He leaves the pictures unpainted and the music unsung and the problems unsolved that man might know the joys and the glories of creation. The, the trick is in this is that we need to enjoy the ride. This is a process. It is not an event. It, it doesn't just happen immediately it doesn't just happen one day that you know how to do everything in sales it's always a development process it's always learning and growing and getting outside of your self-imposed prison in your mind and a lot of a lot of your leaps and bounds are going to come with that imprisonment in your mind when you're frustrated when you dis when you're when you have a scarcity mentality when you have when you're thinking, um, what if I don't close this person? What if I don't close this person? And you have that fear, that is faith working against you. When you're focused on or your desire is not to do something and you're worried about doing it, then you're going to end up doing it. But if you're calm, collected, and you're okay with the the outcome and the and your expectation is only of you doing your best and developing your skills necessary to become effective in doing doTERRA that's when you're going to see a change in how people respond to how you approach them because you'll start to approach them differently you'll start you'll start to approach them with abundance mindset with um, an intention to heal and help and and keep them in health and and um, so that is one thing that our faith tool does now, the desire or the will, a desire is a strong feeling of wanting to have something or wishing for something to happen. A will is expressing the future tense. So I really like this quote, and it's from Alma. He says, he allotteth, he's talking about God. He says, God allotteth unto men, yea, decreeth unto them decrees which are unalterable according to their will. So God works on our will. God, the universe, uh, karma, whatever you want to call it, works uh, according to our will. And just to give you an idea, like the reason that successful people have a really hard time explaining what they do and how they're successful is because they will it, they desire it, they will it, and they've, they never give up that desire or will. Um, I once read something that said the number one uh, attribute that people attribute to success in life is not intelligence. It is not uh, where they were born. It is their desire, their tenacity to never give up in the face of adversity. So when you look at successful people, their desire and will out, outflank or out, um, out it outdoes their, um, their pain of failure. They never will give up. They keep going and going and going and going. Um, and they find success in some form or another. Now, the same thing happens in, on the other, the other side of that, if you have a desire or will that is detrimental to you, then it, the same thing will happen. Take drug addicts, for example. And I know all of you probably know or have heard of someone who's been a drug addict. Now, when the drug addict actually goes out and they, um, they will, let, let's say they're trying to recover and so they move to a different state. Well, that drug addiction is very strong, and I'm sure you guys know of, of people who have moved from one town to another to try to escape their addiction. It may have been a whole state or two or three or four states where they only knew one person, maybe an aunt or uncle or cousin or something they moved in with. And within a week, they know who sells drugs, how much they are, how, you know, and how all that stuff works. And you could have lived in that town your whole life, but you don't know who sells drugs, who uses them, or anything like that. And this person has been there a week and they found that. And that's because they had a desire and will to do it. And, and that desire or will is something that God or the universe or karma is not going to take away from anyone. 
they're going to have the ability to find that and it's going to be worked according to their will. So then if we go into the subconscious versus, versus conscious mind of how all this works together in conjunction with one another, um, I want you guys to watch this, this YouTube video here as well. Hopefully we can hear it. Uh, it's kind of low, but. Hey Scott, I think you um, have frozen. Can you not? Can you not oh, hear? There, the, there we go. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. When I play the when I play the YouTube stuff, can you guys hear that or no? No. Uh. -uh. Okay, I will skip that then. Okay. I'll just explain what they said. Not as good as they they do, but I can explain. Okay. So ant versus elephant. If you guys get a chance. Um, you uh, Google search ant versus elephant and watch a little clip. It's like a two minute clip on how, this guy that explains how our subconscious is like an elephant and our conscious is like an ant. And basically when you are processing a conscious thought, it processes with 2000 neurons, uh, 2000 neurons per second. In that same second, your subconscious, your subconscious brain is processing 4 billion um, thought processes in the same time that your consciousness is only doing 2,000. And so what that means is, is that if you had an elephant and you had an ant on top of the elephant and you were thinking consciously, like this is where the secret and some of these other books where if you think positively, you'll start to move that way. Then what happens is if your ant is the conscious brain and your elephant is your subconscious, and obviously an elephant is bigger than the ant, if the subconscious brain is headed north and the ant is on the back of the elephant and it is headed south, what direction are you, are you going? Okay. The answer is, is you're going north with the elephant and the ant thinks it's getting somewhere, but it's not getting anywhere. It's going the opposite direction. And so changing your habits and your abilities starts in your subconscious mind. You have to start to understand what you're, how you're establishing. Um, Kimberly, can you mute your phone? Get a lot of feedback on this side. Okay. Um, so the ant versus elephant, you're getting that those wires crossed. So um, what does it mean in creation as we establish habits? Ask and you shall receive. That's a, that's a big thing um, you got to ask. Now in your, in, your uncon in, your con or in your subconscious brain, whenever somebody comes to you and says, hey, you're beautiful, uh, your subconscious brain asks questions. It's always asking questions to find results, to find meaning, and to deliver that meaning into a file folder that, that will then press on your subcon or on your conscious brain, and it will influence your conscious and logical um, actions. So, if someone says, "Hey, you're beautiful," if you say in, in your subconscious brain, you're like, "Hey, thank," or or consciously you say, "Thank you," then in your subconscious brain, your subconscious brain will start to start to ask itself, "Why am I beautiful?" Now, your subconscious brain doesn't understand time. It never sleeps. It's always running, and it houses every memory or experience you've ever had from the time you were conceived. So the minute you were conceived to the time that you have now, every experience is always before your subconscious brain, and it's going to be filtering through those experiences. And so when it is asked a question, it is like an internal Google in your brain. So it's important to ask your subconscious, question, your subconscious the right questions because when you ask it the wrong questions, you get the wrong answers and then you get the wrong perception of life and the wrong perspective of life. And what I mean by that is if somebody came up and said, you're ugly and you allowed that to enter into your conscious and you said, that person believes I'm ugly, I believe I'm ugly, why am I ugly? 
then what happens in your subconscious brain has all these experiences before it, and now it'll say, well, in second grade, so-and-so said I was ugly. In fifth grade, so-and-so said I was ugly. In, you know, my mom didn't do, you know, my mom didn't think to buy me nice clothes, but she did my sister because I think she thought she was prettier than me. That must mean that my mom even thinks I'm ugly. So now all these experiences start to pile up on each other. And pretty soon you start to believe that you're ugly and it's just somebody else's perspective. It should never be your own perspective. So you got to be really careful about what you ask the subconscious brain. But now once you actually have the ability to know and can be intentional about putting the right questions into your subconscious, you can consciously ask good questions. So instead of um, using affirmations, I would encourage you to use affirmations. And I got that from Noah St. John. Um, and so you guys should look up Noah St. John. He's got a great book out there that goes through this. And I'll just give a brief interlude of what an affirmation is. So an affirmation, affirmation. So an affirmation is where you get up in the mirror and you say, man, you're good looking and gosh darn it, people like you. An affirmation is it is a question in the form of what you'd like your subconscious to start working on compiling those articles of experiences that relate to exactly what you're trying to accomplish for the, your subconscious to then press on your conscious mind to change your conscious logic into what you want to perceive. And to do that, you have to ask the question. You can't make a statement of it. You can't say, you're good looking, and gosh darn it, people like you. You have to ask the question of, why am I good looking? Why is it that people like to be around me? Why is it that people like to hang out with me and go do things with me? Um, why am I going to be successful at teaching this doTERRA class? Why am I um, successful at talking with entrepreneurs, with people who have good networks? Why, you know, these things you can ask those questions. And even if you're, if you have like other things that you want to work on, you ask questions of what you want to become so that then your subconscious brain can go through all of your experiences and say, in first grade, you made a great presentation. People really liked it. In fifth grade, you had friends that just loved to be around you because of who you were. And so now it'll start to build those evidences and then your perception will change. It will become your elephant will change directions because the subconscious brain is now creating that. Okay. So I call this going from unconscious incompetence to conscious incompetence. So now that you know that you can change something, you're still going to be incompetent at it because you haven't experienced it enough to actually change it. But consciously, if you will will make those changes, you'll start to be consciously competent in them as well. So one day, just like that master builder, you build enough houses one day, he knows how to make a perfect 90 and he can do it in less than two seconds. He's just practiced and polished and he can do it. And so now he's into conscious competency. And then pretty soon, he doesn't even have to think about it. He just knows what to do. He can look at plans and they directly correlate into how he needs to make it materially with his hands. So now he's in unconscious competency. So it's very important. There's those four things, unconscious incompetence, conscious incompetence, conscience competency, and unconscious competency, okay? Um, so when, when you have a new builder come in, and I have about five minutes left, so I appreciate everybody hanging in there with me. Um, when you have a new person who wants to get on board and do doTERRA with you, they are still an they still have an employee mindset versus an entrepreneur mindset. Even entrepreneurs who, this is a completely different entrepreneurial mindset than multi-level marketing because you're duplicating. Entrepreneurs are used to doing it all themselves. Employees are used to being told how to do it all themselves. So they're given a task list and they're, they're told, this is what you need to do to succeed. So the employees, um, you know, we grow up in a public school system that says, you know, you have to raise your hand. Can a teacher can I go to the bathroom? Yes. The teacher lays work in front of you. You need to do this math problem. You need to read this book. You need to accomplish this. And you get, you get graded and you get rewarded based upon your accomplishment. 
but you've never had to go up. Maybe you've never had to, or a lot of your people who want to do doTERRA want freedom, but they don't know. There's not a checklist of what you have to have for freedom. And each person is different. So even if there was a checklist, a master checklist, it wouldn't fit for each person that you had. So it's important to give them things to do, small things to do, to become successful in doTERRA. You can't just sit back and hope that they'll figure it out. Because in that employee mindset, they've always been given something to do and how to do it, when to do it, and when it's due. And so work with them in that mindset until they start to wean themselves. And you can wean them as well into an entrepreneurial mindset where you can start, you give them things to do initially, and then you start to ask questions about what they think they should do. And then if they get it right, you give them a thumbs up and now you're starting to change that subconscious thought pattern of theirs to feeling competent and their perspective of their choices starts to elevate to where that elephant starts to turn around and starts to head the same way the ant does. So it's important to wean them away from their employee mindset to an entrepreneurial multi-level marketing duplication system mindset. Okay. So um, a lot of people will come into this mindset as whatever comes along is how I'll get along. And what you need to help them come towards is when I get along is when what I want comes along. They're determinant of their future. They're determinant of how those things come into their life, but they're the ones that are going to have to create it. When they come into building, I always tell my new builders this, okay? you're going to have to decide to ask those questions to your subconscious brain. Why am I good at this? Why can I do this? Why am I capable? Um, why do I desire it over the failures that I've had as I work towards it? And they're going to have to decide certain things. Okay. Just like when you, and I'll get into the decide a little bit more here in a second, but I want to give you guys an analogy. When you exercise your muscles, what happens? Okay. You're, you're tearing and you're breaking those muscles down and then they grow and they build up stronger. Okay. So you break down to build up. Okay. Emotionally, you've got to tell your people that they're going to go through some emotional, they're going to go through like that emotional exercise. There's going to be something that has to die for something else to build and grow bigger. Okay. So when you decide something, there's a side at the end. That means the death of a killer of pesticides, a killer, genocide's a killer, homicide, the death of suicide is the death of. That means D side is the death of. What is the, the death, the death of? Decision or deciding something means that something has to die for something else to live. Okay. So when we do that, we always go through a grief cycle. So when you're asking your subconscious mind, why am I good at doTERRA? Why can I figure, you know, why is it that I'm good at figuring out um, my, what I want in doTERRA, what I need in doTERRA? Why am I good at figuring out the skills necessary for success in doTERRA? Uh, without fail, between three and six weeks, they're going to go through this grief cycle. They're going to be going really good for three to six weeks. And then what's going to happen is in their subconscious brain, their new method of doing something is going to start trumping their old one. And it's going to be counter or opposite to that other thing in their subconscious brain. So what's going to happen is that other thing is going to try to kill the new idea. And the way it does that is it basically tries to create self-sabotage and it, and it creates emotional distress in the person's life to where they don't feel comfortable. And so what they do, and this has happened, I've known 10 people in about three to six weeks, I get an email that says, or a text because they don't want to tell me in, to my face. They say, Scott, I really appreciate you helping me with doTERRA, but I don't, excuse me, I don't know if it's for me because of whatever reason. And then they retract they constrict into themselves and what they do is they've almost built this new habit and this old habit is about to die and it doesn't want to die. And so it comes out and it creates self-loathing, self-sabotage, and it starts to get people to restrict back into themselves. And so what it does is it kills that new software plan that was about to overwrite the old crappy habit that you have. 
And so you'll go through with your mentor, if you're not going through some of these steps, your mentor is not doing a very good job because he's not, he or she's not giving you the opportunity to change. And every time that you decide to change or every time your, your mentor identifies and your, your mentor and you identify how you can make it to that next step, if you don't go through some of these feelings, then you're not really you're not really growing in doTERRA. So if you're not going through some of this stuff where you're kind of mad at your, uh, you know, you're you're shocked at the shocked and denial that one of your friends or mentors would tell you such a thing, you're angry at them for it. You kind of detach and and depress away from them. And then you have dialogue with them. Oh, well, I really like your suggestion, but if I could just do it my way, this way, so you're like meeting them halfway, but you're going to like halfway do the thing, but then you're not really going to do it. That's your bargaining. But until you actually just come to the acceptance that that person who's gone through it and knows how to get to the other side and that you're willing to accept and move forward with that change and work towards it, then your growth will stagger. And the quicker you can go through the grief cycle processes with the things that you decide to overcome in your life. Um, or in your doTERRA life or any, any part of your life is, is how quickly you're going to progress in your skill set because the tools are already there. It's just a matter of going out and doing it so that you become, you, you hone that skill, the tools there, you just need to hone the skill. So the last thing that I tell all of my people that come in to do this business is that you're going to feel like you're going to constrict that you're going to want to pull away from me in about three to six weeks when you're doing these things. When that happens, you don't get to quit. You got to push through it. And so when they come to me and they say, and they write me that letter, I just call, I call them back up. I will not text them back or email them back. I call them up and I minimize their objection and maximize their opportunity or maximize the vision that they had. And I remind them, I said, Hey, remember I, I told you to go through this. It's no big deal. Everybody goes through it. You just need to get, come to the other side of it. Keep doing what you're doing. Don't ruin all of your relationships through self-sabotage. Be conscious of what you're doing. Be intentional in what you're trying to accomplish. And don't allow that bad habit, that old habit, to sneak in and, and sabotage you. And really put up that stop loss for themselves. And then what that does is when they're in that emotional state, if you've already told them that that's going to happen, then you can safely minimize that objection and maximize that vision or opportunity that they told you about, and you can help them get through that. So I want to thank everybody for being on who is on. Uh, if any of you guys have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Um, if not, thanks for, thanks for being here. Thanks, Scott. Um, I don't know if the other Kim or Nancy, do you have a question or anything? Or are you good? I'm good. Okay, <laughs> perfect. Okay, thank you guys so much for coming. And sorry, Jen, not here. Like I said, I'll be with this. So, anyways, I hope everyone has a great day. And thanks again, Scott, for doing the training. Yeah, see ya. Bye bye.